welcome everyone. What an amazing afternoon is in store for all of us and, and the weather. Uh, spent the whole summer worrying about this weather and it finally came out for us. Um, I am pleased to invite the Laurel Hill Association's Vice President, Robert Sedgwick, to share with us the land acknowledgement to the Mohican Muncie Stockbridge Tribe. Sorry for the delay. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Thank you.
Hill Day brings our community together in a very special way. Today, for an annual celebration of our 170th year. 170 years, just think about it. Think about it. In this country, that's really old. The Metropolitan Opera is celebrating its 140th year and they think that's old. Uh, Yellowstone National Park was established in 1872, and the National Park Service is a relative youngster with its formation in 1916. It's just wonderful that Laurel Hill Association is still going strong. And thanks to all of you who come and support us, help us with the trails, and be reverent to the to the land. Um, seven years before the Civil War, just in case you didn't think we were going back in history at all, uh, Mary Hopkins Goodrich, our founder, set Laurel Hill Association on a course of land stewardship that continues until today. Laurel Hill set a national standard which has been recognized from the late 19th century in fact, it's an anticipated that a book written by a prominent historian will be published in 2024 and will analyze the career of Mary Hopkins Goodrich and her Laurel Hill Association contribution to the National Village Improvement Movement. Today, land stewardship has never been more important. Accelerating climate change challenges all of us to devote our best efforts to help slow a process that could be disastrous for all. I, I remember the first Earth Day in April 1970. As a soon-to-graduate student at Simons Rock, my classmates and I took a day off from classes. Special seminars were held introducing us to terms such as greenhouse effect and carbon capture, which were totally foreign to us, terms that today are a part of everyday conversation. The mantra of the 1960s was to think globally and act locally. We were urged to consider the health of the entire planet and to take action in our own communities and cities. Local activism started long before governments began enforcing environmental laws. We were all encouraged to protect habitats and the organisms that live within them. In our own hometown, our neighbor Arlo Guthrie had to have a night in Bill Oppenheim's Buskow <laughs> to ponder the importance of good environmental practices. <laughs> such as throwing your garbage all over Prospect Hill. 
big no-no. <laughs> anyway, we all read Stuart Brand's whole Earth catalog with an iconic globe on the cover, remember that? And a hippie vision of environmentalism. Think Globally, Act Locally originally began at the grassroots level and is now a global concept of great importance. It cannot just be Greta Thunberg and other high-minded volunteers who work to preserve the environment. Finally, corporations and government officials are beginning to recognize their duty of stewardship. Laurel Hill is important. Importance extends far beyond our lovely 500 acres. One, local children often first learned about nature as they hiked our trails and scrambled through the ice glen. Two, during the recent pandemic, Laurel Hill glades and overlooks provided a restful sanctuary and psychic re restoration. Three, we, probably claim, we proudly claim that our preserved lands offset the equivalent of the carbon generated by 116 homes in our town of Stockbridge. And lastly, our beloved Mary Flynn Trail enables individuals who are physically challenged to enjoy our lovely Berkshire woods and river views. The Laurel Hill Association is an all-volunteer association wholly dependent on the efforts of board members and friends to enable us to preserve and protect our Stockbridge green space. As Frederick Law Olmsted said about Central Park, it's the lungs of New York. And I feel that Laurel Hill is the lungs of Stockbridge. So let's keep those lungs clear and going with just offering to help like a lot of people did today. Um, we encourage everybody in the audience to lend hands on help and critical financial support as we work to fulfill the dream begun 107 years ago. I love repeating that, it just, <laughs> wow. 170 years ago. Your help has sustained us over the years and has never been more important. Thank you so much. It's especially appropriate that this Laurel Hill Day's keynote speaker is a visionary modern forester. Starling Childs has spent a lifetime managing forest lands and teaching young people about the challenges facing them. A 1976 graduate of Yale College, Starr holds a BS degree in geology and geophysics and a master's degree in forest science from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Starr has worked with state and local governments as well as private, private individuals to assess and administer their lands for eco ecologically sensitive development along with forestry and wildlife management. Starr has pursued several entrepreneurial ventures, notably uh, ventures, notably yogurt production and sales of Stonyfield, my favorite yogurt, a nationally known brand, have done beautifully. Starr serves locally as president of the Berkshire Litchfield Environmental Conservancy. For the past 30 years, Starr has served as a founding board member and officer of the Great Mountain Forest Corporation, which is a not-for-profit operating foundation that oversees <laughs> scholarly research and educational programs, as well as the ongoing long-term management of his family's 6,100-acre working forest and wildlife preserve in northwestern Connecticut. In short, he has spent a lifetime developed to the issue, devoted to issues of forestry and the environment. Please join me in welcoming Star Child. I didn't think I was actually going to need a microphone. I, 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 when I first came here, I thought, well, it's a, it's a virtual amphitheater. I won't need a microphone. I didn't know I was going to have one. Uh, 
thank you, Hillary. Uh, greetings, Laurel Hill Associates, friends of Stockbridge. Our big day has arrived. Uh, a, a quick disclaimer, I, it, the pre-billing of this had me as a founder of Stonyfield Yogurt. And if Gary Hirschberg or Sam Kamen, the founders of Stonyfield Yogurt, were here, they're friends of mine. Um, uh, or if they're zooming in from Gary's uh, entrepreneurship training center in New Zealand or whatever, I was a seed investor when they moved from their dairy barn milk room. Pretty good, well, you know, inoculated environment to a, a full-scale production facility they still run in London, New Hampshire today. So I got in early and I held on for a long, long time and it was a wonderful thing to see their, their yogurt take off from a national brand uh, through guerrilla marketing, I might say. Uh, I'm honored and humbled to be here standing on this incredibly historic rostrum and, uh, and giving you a little bit of the history of our forest and some of the tie it into where we are, where we find ourselves today. I must thank Hillary, of course, for reaching out and inviting me up for a sandwich here in, in uh, Stockbridge back in May and, and introducing me to a place I never even knew existed. I didn't know anything about Laurel Hill. I don't know about Laurel Hill Park. And uh, so I was happy to come up here and learn about Mary Hopkins Goodrich and what she had first inspired here 170 years ago today. Um, I had only a little limited knowledge of all the famous families of Stockbridge. I've known Sedgwick's, I've, uh, I've heard of Sargent's, and I know Chokes and French's, to name but a few. Uh, but with the help of my edification, Hillary had sent me a copy of the uh, Mary Margaret French Cresson's Centennial History of the organization, which I began to read with some great interest. But as fate would have it, my nine-month-old uh, Rhodesian Ridgeback, who had also caused a bit of a stir and commotion in town when his nose took him down to the cheese shop, uh, <laughs> had grown tall enough to reach the bedside table in our bedroom. And I must confess that he tried to eat, literally ate my homework. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I have a search bot out there looking for the irreplaceable rare book that this is. Uh, but the, page, the written pages survived, and I was able to learn a lot about the history of the organization and what your predecessors have done here, all the good works here decades since, and what's launched literally across this country to spawn, to spawn other municipal organizations and, and community associations. In fact, when I first moved back to Norfolk years ago where I live, uh, I was asked to join the community association in Norfolk and served on it for a number of years. That's where I, I hail from. I have a wife Michelle, I have three children, grown children, and two granddaughters, uh, Rowan and Daphne. Note the somewhat horticultural overtone there. And uh, my daughter named them when they were both born. And it's to them I'd like to dedicate this sort of uh, address today. Because I'm sure, like, like so many uh, little kids, they, they love the natural world. And I'm sure in time they'll come to learn just how lucky they are to be growing up in that green, green, reforested hill of southern New England. Dr. Rachel Carson, whose book Silence Spring on the dangers of persistent poisons in our in the, light, the web of life, uh, virtually launched the modern environmental movement that Hillary referred to when, when Earth Day kicked off back in 1970. I think I got a day in Boston out of that, the prep school I went day in Boston. But she also wrote another book celebrating children in nature, a sense of wonder. One quote that always guided me since I first discovered this book on my father's bookshelf was something like this. If children are to keep alive their inborn sense of wonder, they need the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with them the incitement, the joy, and the mystery of the world we live in. And such was the experience I had growing up in a large family-owned forest with a father who had spent many hours with us out in the forest exploring and encouraging us to see, to learn, to understand all we could about the woods. And I'm sure my granddaughters will find that's the same thing that will go for them, as many young, young children here in Stockbridge, as Hillary mentioned, have enjoyed uh, all the wonders of the Laurel Hill Association and their, and their families with them. But before I go too far into the history of that family forest and my involvement with land management and uh, ecological restoration, 
want to take a few moments to reflect on where we are in the current trajectory of natural systems and, dare I say, what I call perturbed global climatic regimes. And what a summer this has been, as Hillary said. She worried because it, this has been a particularly uh, pluvial summer, if, if I can use the word. Um, a awful lot of precipitation has come our way. Well, we began June by breathing the air masses, unsafe air masses conveyed into our Northeast and Atlantic states with conveying with them harmful concentrations of fine particulate matter and spiking air quality indices off the chart in our cities and filling our skies with smoke far from far off forest fires, Northern Quebec, and even as far west as, as uh, British Columbia. Following the smoky air, our wobbling jet stream led to the formation of oppressive heat domes, which began to form or are still forming and lodging themselves over the American Southwest, the Midwest, across Europe, Euro-Asia, and Far East. July was pronounced the hottest month ever on Earth. And on July 3rd, the world news happily blared out the global average temperature on that day had marked the hottest day on Earth, with more surely to follow. Clearly, they weren't going back to the Cretaceous or, the, or somewhere, you know, the dinosaurs were growing. But in, in any case, certainly heat was in the news. We have also were reported that surface ocean temperatures around the globe were reaching new records of the Gulf waters off the Florida Keys and Western Mediterranean approaching 100 degrees Fahrenheit and leading to devastating increases in coral bleaching events, reef mortality in many parts of the world. Given that over 70% of our planet is covered by open oceans, the amount of solar heat they daily absorb retain and retain grows warmer and more dangerous with each passing year. The astonishing scientific fact that our oceans absorb the solar radiation equivalent to four thermonuclear blasts, the size of which destroyed Hiroshima, every second of every day. Deep ocean currents move that heat distribute it and release it around the globe, but less and less of that heat is now able to be dissipated back into space. Much of it, like our terrestrial re-radiation, is trapped in the atmosphere, as if under glass in a greenhouse. With each passing year, we're witnessing civilization's still growing levels of fossil fuel emissions, excessive deforestation, wildfires that, that deprive us of the carbon sequestration of our forests. The rising concentration of carbon dioxide molecules and other off-gassing of our modern world trap more and more heat in our lower atmosphere. And it should come as no surprise that I chose to side with the 97% of climate and environmental scientists who say we're on a very dangerous trend. Here in the Northeast, there was not so much heat in July, but the excessive rainfall events, uh, the, the previous speaker with the Raptors spoke of it that rapidly overwhelmed our stormwater management systems, destroying roads, bridges, and pushed rivers out of their banks. Poor old Vermont, where storms stalled for a time, experienced some of the major flooding damages in Montpelier and other towns. Atmospheric physics are not partisan science. It simply sticks to the laws of thermodynamics, evaporation, and saturation. Science is quick to point out that with each degree of centigrade rise in average air temperature, Water vapor held aloft will increase 7%. Or more simply put, a warming atmosphere can increase water vapor suspended aloft exponentially. Water vapor is also a potent greenhouse gas. Thank God it is. And when air masses collide and encounter cooler air aloft, the vapor rapidly condenses and falls back to Earth. These passing storms now become known as rain bombs. Never heard that when I was younger dumping water earthward at unprecedented rates. Tropical air masses passing over our now superheated ocean waters rapidly intensify and lead to more destructive hydrological events, even if the accompanying wind fields of those hurricanes or storms do not reach hurricane force. The drying effect of excessive heat waves literally sucks soil moisture out of the forest and the landscape setting them up to become the tinderboxes that we see more and more of. Wildfires have increased throughout the summer months across North America, the Mediterranean region, and even the Russian Far East. Welcome to what some scientists are now calling the era of the piracy. If I had the ability to graphi graphically display here, uh, 
that the Canadian forest area consumed this year alone against all other years, it would literally be eye-popping. I might even have to get on a stepladder, much like Al Gore did in his famous movie, An Inconvenient Truth, in order to point to the top of the chart. The now so-called fire season is not even over yet. Already 10 times more Canadian forest is burned than does in an average year. The area burned thus far equals South Korea in size, or approximately 30 million acres. And with that amount of forest loss, the release stored carbon in the living trees equals about 290 million tons. Scientists equate that to the annual fossil fuel emissions of Indonesia, and more emissions are yet to come, with fires still burning out of control in the northern boreal forest. It should not be forgotten that vast areas of boreal forests and all forests lost to fire have compounding effects on biodiversity. Habitat areas lost in these immolated forests that once provided for avian, mammalian, amphibian, fauna alike, not to mention the critical plants and fungal associations that went part of that forest. And sadly, too, many of these northern fires are impacting indigenous communities and their traditional subsistence ways of life. And to bring us to where we are as we head into Labor Day weekend, and bid farewell to this dreadful summer of 2023, Hillary was in the news again. No, not dear Hillary Dealey, though spelled with one L, or, or our much maligned Secretary, former Secretary Clinton, but once again, most unusual, unprecedented, first ever, unexpected, extraordinary, choose a word that scientists generally don't like to say, but was all through the news, a Category 4 hurricane that had rapidly intensified and then became a tropical storm as it made landfall over the desert biome of Baja, California, and made its way up into the American Southwest. Palm Desert received nearly a year's worth of rain in 24 hours, not to mention the San Bernardino Mountains, which saw as much as 18 inches of rain. And I hardly see anything like that. Mudslides and debris flows out of former wildfire burn scars came pouring down out of the mountains causing all kinds of trouble. This notorious tropical depression, Hillary, continued northwards into the dry inland empire regions of Idaho, eastern Oregon, western Montana, and if there is a silver lining in that storm cloud, if you'll excuse, excuse the expression, the rains might just have warded off some of the wildfires to the, in those tinder dry regions, at least for this year. This year has also seen extraordinary rainfall flooding events in Brazil, Central Africa, Italy, Slovenia, Beijing, China, and across northern India and Southeast Asia. Here again, the science of climate modeling indicates that continuing anthropogenic atmospheric warming will only lead to more such extreme precipitation events. But Hillary asked me, don't be too depressing in your remarks <laughs> or about the state of our world, and dwell on such climate-related extreme weather events. Philip has followed me on Facebook for quite a number of years now, and he will have come to know me as somewhat of a, what they call in this day and age, a doom scroller. He posts or reports the stories of extreme weather and human suffering for all to see. And I've made it a bit of a habit to follow on social media of the posts of many of the world's leading climate scientists, many of whom are not surprisingly very pessimistic. But one in particular, the senior climate scientist for the Nature Conservancy, who posts regularly under the username, the real Professor Catherine Hayhoe, still believes we have ample time and plenty of the right technology to reverse course, cut emissions, draw down a sufficient amount of carbon, excess carbon dioxide that we've injected into the atmosphere, <clears throat> and since the dawn of the industrial age. Dr. Hayhoe does not fit the mold of the average, uh, the, the typical climate scientist advocates, climate advocates. She's well respected, first and foremost a brilliant scientist when it comes to the complexities of atmospheric physics, thermo and fluid dynamics, but she's also a devout practicing Christian evangelist. She, unlike many of her fellow evangelicals who choose to deny climate science, believes that in fact we do have a mandate from the Almighty Lord herself take better care of all biodiversity and wondrous life forms, life-affirming natural resources, which the Creator insisted we have dominion and practice good stewardship. She's often heard saying in a TED Talk or on her PBS blog post called Global Weirding, 
that in order to make a real difference when it comes to the topic of climate change, we all need to talk about it as much as we can in small gatherings or at public meetings. The blog titles are often humorous as they are meant to be thought-provoking lead-ins to the science itself. Like, what, like this one, is carbon dioxide really a pollutant? I'm giving it off right now. I live in the Midwest. Does climate change really matter to me? Or this is something happening 80 years from now, so not my problem. Or she calls the six stages of denialism, quote, it's not real. It's not us. It's not that bad. It's too expensive to fix. And, oh, no. No, wait. Aha. There's a great solution. It doesn't actually do anything. And, oh, no. Now it's too late. You should have told me earlier. But it's happening now, and extreme heat, flooding, fires are affecting people who are at least able to do anything about it, who contributed the least to the causes of climate impacts. We are at an inflection point in history, a crisis with clear and present danger is much the same as the historical fear of a wood famine that led our earliest forest conservation leaders to establish timber reserves and protect forest and watershed lands here in New England and across North America. The emerging science of forest management and ecological restoration were born out of a necessity to stop the wanton destruction of over-harvesting of public and private forest lands in the latter part of the 19th century. The progressive era ushered in a new public approach to the importance of protecting and managing our nation's forest lands. The cradle of American forestry was first established on the cutover forest lands, hundreds of thousands of acres of them, in the vast estate Cornelius Vanderbilt in Asheville, North Carolina. At the behest of his landscape architect, already mentioned here today and last year's speaker, Frederick Law of Olmsted admonished Vanderbilt to hire a German forester named Carl Schenk and a young Yale graduate who had studied forestry and post-graduation of Yale College in France. His name was Gifford Pinchot. Olmsted is purported to have said to Mr. Vanderbilt in 1896, quote, this is your chance. This would be a great contribution and service to the country to show how a systematic managed forest could not only benefit the land, but the landowner at the same time. According to your historian, Mary French Cresson, whose book I hold again, <laughs> according to her, this association's incorporation in 1904 coincided with the support by the association of two important bills, one to establish an office of a state forester and two, to better protect the forests of Massachusetts. These initiatives were right on the heels of Connecticut's 1903 establishment of a state forester and first state forest, Mashamakan, which was preceded in 1900 by the creation of the nation's first school of forestry at Yale, as, as uh, Hillary mentioned. That was funded with a gift from the Pinchot family. The risk of future timber famine was an overarching concern when Gifford Pinchot founded the school and the U.S. Forest Service and took to advocating and fighting special interest groups and timber barons for the establishment of national forest reserves. His clarion call for scientific management and sustained yields of timber from our nation's forests were encapsulated in his paraphrasing of Jeremy Bentham's utilitarian philosophy, the greatest good for the greatest number, for the long run. He added for the long run or over the long run to ensure that people understood the ability of forests to be maintained in perpetuity and yet yield continuously public goods and services. And it was around this same point in history that my grandfather and namesake, along with his good friend, college roommate Fred Walcott, from the Yale days together, chose to come to Norfolk, Connecticut and establish a large private land preserve intended to demonstrate the importance of restoring cutover forest lands and at the same time restore populations of game animals that had been extirpated from the land or, or were continuing to be overhunted to the point of no return. They had witnessed the wasteful overhunting of decline of bison herds, the ever-diminishing flocks of passenger pigeons soon to be extinct, and other migratory waterfowl and birds overhunted for feather adornments in the millinery trade, and they felt they had to take a stand. Their fledgling Childs Walcott Game Preserve was created to demonstrate to others 
how important the work of conserving and restoring natural forest and aquatic habitats in the landscape was for the protection and preservation of game birds and other animals, of which they themselves enjoyed the love of hunting too. The forest at that time, probably much like this part of Western Massachusetts, had been cleared away for hard scrabble farms or heavily over harvested in order to provide firewood for heating, or even more so to fuel the iron furnaces and forges that ran along the Housatonic River and its many tributary rivers where water power could be harnessed for the blast furnaces. The mountaintop forest lands were owned by several iron companies for the production of charcoal, which was an exceedingly high carbon fuel, perfect for smelting the rich iron ores of this region. The historic Salisbury iron industry did not fail for lack of iron ore or for loss of, of limestone for flux, there being so much limestone in our valleys here, or for water power, which was plentiful. But rather, by the early 1900s, the forest could not be regrown fast enough to provide more charcoal. My father recalled as a young boy of six years in 1911, six years old, 1911, he would ride on his pony over the charcoal trails of the, of the mountain. He could see over the tops of the tiny stump sprouts, the seedlings, and the shrubs at the beginnings of a new forest recovering the rocky uplands. Childs and Walcott acquired a few abandoned old farms and much of the mountaintop charcoal lands for as much as five or ten cents an acre, and thousands of acres were quickly stitched together from the iron companies that were gradually going bankrupt. Much to the amusement of the locals at that time, who felt these city slickers, Wall Street guys, were spending their good money after bad, good-for-nothing, rocky mountain land. But over the course of time, my father attended Yale College and Yale's Forest School in order to better understand the management of what had become the family's nearly 10 square miles of rapidly regenerating native hardwood and hemlock forest. And in the 1930s, my dad took over his father's ownership and renamed the former family game preserve, now a rapidly regrowing forest, as I said, Great Mountain Forest. He had learned from a local historian that Native Americans, like the Scaticokes and the Mohawk tribes who frequented the Housatonic River Valley, had referred to the steep-faced Canaan Mountain Massif and its plateau, where wild game had been plentiful, as the Great Mountain. And over the years since then, the forest has been professionally managed by several full-time trained foresters and numerous student interns who study of forestry and natural resources is augmented by their summer practicum at our forest. After Yale's forest school lost its 7,000 acre standing forest in eastern Connecticut to the gale force winds of a category five hurricane in 1938, my dad and Senator Walcott built a, a summer field camp on their property so that the training of young Yale foresters could continue uninterrupted, but still near New Haven. In fact, this morning, at nine o'clock, I was out there at the camp talking to a whole new crop of incoming Yale forestry students. This also kept the forest in touch with the emerging science of silviculture and allowed Yale professors to conduct research on the forest. During the early days of the 20th century, our New England and Appalachian forests lost one of the greatest tree species and a phenomenal resource as an accidental introduction of soil fungus from Asia decimated the American chestnuts everywhere. To this day, that is considered the greatest of ecological tragedies in our country. To this, uh, <clears throat> we still find the rot-resistant stumps of salvaged chestnut trees, and in some cases, standing dead stems leaning against their neighboring tree way out in the forest. Early on, my father worked with pathologists and forest scientists at the Kinetic Agricultural Experiment Station to try and develop and reintroduce disease-resistant strains of chestnut. To this day, we still continue to work with the American Chestnut Foundation um, with, with some of their resistant hybrids out in the experimental breeding orchard that we've established on the forest. I always note the presence, too, of a similar orchard here in Stockbridge each time I drive by that sign out on Route 7 as I head north. The loss of the chestnut tree was but the first of many ecological assaults on our invasive fronts on our, that have befallen our New England forests. We continue to deal with the periodic outbreaks of introduced and infamous gypsy moth caterpillars, now renamed spongy moths, uh, 
out of political correctness, I'm, I have told, in deference to the sensitivities of the folks who consider themselves gypsies. But they travel like gypsies through our forest, forest canopy, nevertheless. But we have achieved a modicum of biological control over these defoliating insects. But still, they impact our forests through periodic defoliations. And we've watched the progression of the hemlock woolly adelgid, also an Asian introduction, a tiny sap-sucking insect. Its numbers swell and move northward from the time they first appeared in Virginia decades ago. These crawling, minute scale insects, unable to fly, can hitch rides on the feet and feathers of migratory birds. They say that a bird feeder is probably the worst thing you can do to put up near a hemlock tree because it will assure that the hemlock adelgid will arrive as the birds fly onto the tree into the feeder. Dutch elm disease was another fungus of Asian origins that's now carried in the guts of elm bark, the native elm bark beetles. First identified in Holland, hence the name, Dutch elm disease decimated the stately street elms and trees of town and trees towns and campuses, along with the elms of the forested landscape. Efforts to treat mature elms with insecticides and fungi, fungicides have been expensive, but offered some hope of success. Thankfully, some naturally selecting light-resistant elms were identified and are now propagated widely for bee planting. A more recent pest arrival is the winged bark beetle, again from Central Asia. The emerald ash borer, or EAB, arrived in the 1990s, most likely as a larval stowaway in wood pallets for packaging from China. It began to escape into our ash-rich Midwestern forests, flying eastwards and southward, southeastward from Michigan, where it had disembarked, so to speak. We are now losing our mature ash trees everywhere and in very short order, and any solutions for control are not readily available. The newest of the damaging introductions are the microscopic nematodes, or tiny worms, that first appeared in 2012 in Cleveland. Also of Asian origin, they rapidly spread in all directions, taking up residence in the leaves of American and European beech trees here in southern New England by 2019. Their spread, it seems, is facilitated by water and rain, which might make this horrible wet summer one of the worst for our beech trees. The ecological importance of beech in our forests cannot be overstated, and, we, and that yet we may lose this valuable, shade-tolerant, understory tree as well. And I could go on with other pests and other, pests and other pathologies, Asian longhorn beetle, parathrips, scourge of the harlequin-colored hideous markings that introduce Asian spotted lantern flies, for which we have no other control other than if you see one, you squash it on sight. One of Yale School's more famous alumni, who's often considered the father, father of modern ecology, authored a great book of essays on the ethical management of forests and land titled Sand County Almanac. Dr. Aldo Leopold felt quite strongly that it's our duty and our human responsibility to account for all of nature to ensure that we, quote, take on the oldest task in human history, to live on a piece of land without spoiling it, end quote. And like my father and grandfather, he acquired a rundown old farmstead in the nutrient-poor sandy soils and peatlands of central Wisconsin and began to restore forest trees to the landscape to demonstrate just what he preached. My father's admonition to myself and my siblings as his advancing age and decreasing mobility relaxed his hold on the reins was to, quote, do everything in your power to leave the land better than you found it. <laughs> and, and also try to keep it all together. That was a big task. He often reminded me that I would be working for the better forest than he started with when he first came back from forestry school. In the years since his passing in 1996, we've successfully put the whole of Great Mountain Forest under a forest legacy conservation easement, which was monitored by the U.S. Forest Service in the state of Connecticut. Our mother's fee ownership in the property was simultaneously transferred into a 501c3 operating foundation for the purposes of demonstrating scientific methods of sustainable forest management and sound stewardship. The foundation continues with the education of new generation of young forest groups and other students of the natural world through summer practicums and annual programming. And our overall mission is protecting and enhancing the biodiversity of our forest. 
At my urging, in order to accomplish our mission to educate about and address the threats of climate change and forest health, our board of directors enrolled the forest in the California offset marketplace. We sold the existing standing carbon resource above ground biomass for the estimated tonnage in live trees. And we also receive annual payments for the calculated amount of annual radial growth trees put on, which translates into tonnage of carbon sequestered each year, very much as Hillary mentioned about here, the 500 acres of Laurel Hill. This wet growing season, other comments aside, will have been a good one for sequestering carbon, a big, good, good radial ring of growth this year. The sale of these forest carbon offset credits doubled our existing endowment funds under management and has enabled us to maintain on site the forestry staff we have and to hire a few other people to manage the forest and conduct our outreach programs. I don't think my father or my grandfather, who both protected and nurtured the regrowth of our forest and the carbon hungry iron smelters of yore, ever even imagined being paid substantial sums of money to simply retain uh, more and more of the now maturing forest. Remember the people laughed at them for spending five to 10 cents an acre for rock land at no future. Forestry science is changing rapidly. Quite apart from the valuation of standing timber and the sale of logs and lumber of yesteryear, new financial incentives for owners of forest land are now able for what we term ecosystem services. Or, or the uh, Harvard Forest refers to as natural infrastructure that the forests provide. Forests are working for us while we sleep and when we're awake. They protect biodiversity and provide critical habitat for local and migratory species alike. They filter the precipitation and the groundwater resources that we drink and use daily. Trees intercept the slow and slow the stormwater runoff to protect us from flooding. They provide recreational therapy, which is now proven to de-stress our daily lives. Japanese corporations even prescribe time spent in forests to their workers under the term shinrin-yoku, or forest bathing. And when we spend time in a forest, we are literally bathing in the beneficial compounds that trees emit, which are known to science as phytoncides. And these gaseous compounds have proven physiological benefits when breathed into our bloodstream. John Muir was not wrong when he advocated we should, quote, climb the mountain get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy. And while cares drop away like autumn leaves, as age comes on, one source of enjoyment after another is closed. But the nature's source, nature's sources will never fail. It goes on to say, thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find that going out into the mountains is good, is, is like going home. That wildness is necessity. And the mountain parks and reservations are not only useful as fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, but also as fountains of life. And last but not least, in importance, the ecosystem service that makes all life possible, photosynthesis. Trees literally breathe in air laced with carbon dioxide, cycling other nutrients and water through their vascular tissues and utilizing the electromagnetic energy of the sun's rays on their leaves and needles in order to make complex carbohydrates for their growth and for stem strengthening, but all the while transmitting their photosynthetic waste products, water vapor and oxygen, back into our atmosphere. This is the science of carbon absorption or what climate advocates now call carbon drawdown. Our forests everywhere are working day and night, as I said, to sequester what carbon they can from their, in their tissues and bind up any excesses in their roots, below ground reservoirs and fungal networks, soil compounds and other organisms that rarely return that CO2 back to the atmosphere, unless disturbed by deforestation, agricultural uh, land use and or fire. After our beleaguered oceans, the number one global carbon absorption absorbers, although be, uh, along with their associated coastal Martians, mangrove swamps and coral reefs, all of our world's forests, from boreal, temperate to tropical, are the best way to pull down and store excess carbon from our atmosphere, provided their climatic regimes and biomes can be stabilized. 
John Muir again foreshadowed the emerging science evaluation of ecosystem services when he said, when we try to pick out anything in nature by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. If I can revisit Aldo Leopold's, one of his more enduring quotes that haunts me to this day, given my blessings of a good education from my father and other forest ecologists, it goes as follows. Leopold said, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on land is quite invisible to laymen. An ecologist must either harden her shell and make believe that the consequences of science are of no consequences to her. Or she must be the doctor who sees the marks of death in a community and believes itself well, does not want to be told otherwise. Ecology, Leopold continued, is the science of biotic communities, and the ecological conscience is therefore the ethics of community life. An ecological conscience is an affair of the, the affair of the mind as well as the heart. Lines such as these recall what young Mary Hopkins experienced from her back to the pony as she rode to the village and observed unkept degraded lands here around early Stockbridge. That her community spirited organization should have taken hold and lasted and flourished down through the decades, it's a powerful affirmation of what Dr. Leopold and other writers and poets before have suggested is our ethical duty to both the biotic community and life around us and the communities within which we live. Or as Leopold put it in an unpublished manuscript, quote, there are two things that interest me, the relationship of people to each other and the relationship of people to the land. Community associations like the model that Laurel Hill Association grew into and public-private partnerships have taken root in cities and towns all across this great land. The hopeful signs are appearing everywhere in direct response to what I believe is our most pressing, clear and present danger, that of our atmosphere warming too fast and the dangers of such warming will usher in. Collective and collaborative communities are stepping up to respond around the world Renewable energy generation is now the most inexpensive form of electrical power that we can harness. Advances in battery storage and technology will facilitate the water deployment of wind and solar. Communities are embracing concepts of distributed energy systems, embracing microgrids for better resilience and more efficiency of delivery and end use. Community solar projects and solar arrays that also benefit uh, agricultural operations are springing up around the country. Alternative fuels for biological wastes are being developed. People are literally voting to protect forested wildernesses from fossil fuel development, choosing rather to leave that energy in the ground forever, which has recently happened in Ecuador. The majority of people voted not to, to open up indigenous lands for oil, for oil and gas exploration. We are sourcing heat exchange directly from the air and tapping into the constancy of germ, geothermal heat which is, most, which is the most sustainable heat of all. There is great work yet to be done and little time in which to do it. But communities like yours and others around the world are taking, taking up these challenges. Transportation and work will be changed through time. More sustainable means as we saw emerge during the most recent pandemic. And with the advent of electric means of locomotion, younger generations will continue to press forward for newer technologies and lifestyle changes, even as they hold us accountable to the ecological wounds and inactions of the past and our present. A newer day is dawning at state and local levels around America and communities like Stockbridge and my own little town in Norfolk can help usher these in. We all began by protecting forests and trees in our communities, and that seems like it's the best place to start. Letting our forests remain forests forever should be everyone's main goal. Margaret French Cresson wrapped up her centennial message by invoking the word, wise words of Massachusetts' own Mother Nature's son, Henry David Thoreau. Though he died shortly after the association came into being, his words seemed a presage. The existence of a town like Stockbridge, whose people saw fit to protect and preserve the beauty it found in, around its natural surroundings. And I, too, would like to close this address by invoking Thoreauvian wisdom from his long and brilliant essay entitled Walking. In it, he inspired in me and countless others the great joys found simply in sauntering through the wonders of the natural world, either forests, fens, or fields. 
Luckily for Stockbridge residents, such protected areas of the Laurel Hill Association are here in great abundance. Mr. Thoreau seemed to know early on how interconnected and dependent all life is in a community, all life in a community truly is to its natural surroundings. And I dare say Mary Hopkins Goodrich would have agreed. Quote, I wish to speak a word for nature, for absolute freedom and wildness. As contrasted with freedom and culture merely civil, regard man as an inhabitant or a part and parcel of nature rather than a member of society. A person's health requires as many acres of meadow to his or her prospect as their farm does loads of buck. A town is saved not so much by the, not more by the righteous people in it than by the woods and swamps that surround it. A township where one primitive forest stands waving above while another primitive forest lies below, rotting. Such a town is fitted to raise not only corn and potatoes, but poets and philosophers of the coming ages. Thank you. time to time, the Laurel Hill Association has awarded deserving individuals the Community Service Award. This recognition is given in appreciation of people who have made special contributions to Stockbridge in the spirit of the mission of Laurel Hill. I have asked Phil Dealey today, who has known the Burleys, uh, as well as anyone in every di different capacity to read the proclamation for the community award. Philip? Thank you. I might say uh, before I begin to read the proclamation that when Hillary and I moved back to Stockbridge, I was uh, I, I was found by Peter Burley, uh, who asked me if I might serve as treasurer of the Stockbridge Land Trust. And I uh, tried to say, no, 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 <laughs> Peter, I'm, I'm really not, not capable of that. Uh, and he, he said, Philip, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm sure we can teach you in a uh, very short time. So I'm, I'm delighted to read this community service proclamation on behalf of Laurel Hill Association, dated August 26, 2023. Whereas the late Peter A. A. Burley and Lana Wild Burley were among the founding members of the Stockbridge Land Trust in 1968, with Peter serving later a term as president, whereas Peter A. A. Burley spearheaded the Joint Stockbridge Land Trust Laurel Hill Association purchase of the wetlands along Agawam Brook to preserve the southern entrance to the town, whereas Peter A. A. Burley brought the restored Elm Court fire truck to the Lake Mary Flynn and Trail dedication and laying hoses to the Housatonic River created an arched water salute and double rainbow for Mary, 
Whereas Lila Wild Burley faithfully served on the Laurel Hill Association Board of Trustees from 2005 to 2010. Whereas Lila Wild Burley played a significant role on the joint Stockbridge Land Trust Laurel Hill Association Committee in the purchase of the Four Corners property and its subsequent conservation restriction in order to preserve the western entrance of the town. Whereas Lila Wild Burley, while president of the Norman Rockwell Museum Board of Directors, was instrumental in the museum gifting the property between Butler Road and the Housatonic River to the Laurel Hill Association. Whereas Mary A. Burley has worked in many education roles, including principal of Buddy Brook Elementary School for 13 years and as chief educator at the Norman Rockville Museum since 2018. Whereas Mary A. Burley is a hands-on farmer working from dawn to dusk overseeing Lila's Mountain Farm, a 400-acre sheep farm in Great Barrington, known for its meat and wool produced following humane, ecologically sustainable practices. Whereas Mary A. Burley continues and promotes her love of learning and reading, serving on the Board of Trustees of the Stockbridge Library Association. Now, therefore, the Laurel Hill Association of Stockbridge extends thanks and appreciation to the Burley family, Peter, Lila, and Mary, for their years of community service and contributions, amplifying, exemplifying the mission of Laurel Hill to do such things as will improve the quality of life and the environment of the town of Stockbridge. Thank you. The Board of Trustees of the Laurel Hill Association acknowledges the Burley family for their decades of thoughtful preservation and enduring stewardship of properties in Stockbridge and the Berkshire County region. And then we have all of our board members who signed it. So everybody, make, do you want to stand up for one minute? I am very appreciative of people who sit through these things, and it's wonderful. Uh, okay, you may sit. <laughs> I would love to add on to a lot of the words Carolyn put in. I want to thank him for his wonderful voice joining the choir. I don't like mics, needless to say. <laughs> okay. I would like to say that this is one of the traditions that has more value than we really realize. In 1904, I was the speaker, like Mr. Sterling here. Peter, I think, spoke a couple of times. And I'm sure Mary will. Mary is, I have four children, 15 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren who I spent the morning with. There is a lot of hope in that. And, well, I would like to start by saying one of my earliest memories away from High Long Farm was Every day, school day, my parents provided lunch at Miss Buck's, which is the house right over here. 
because my brother, my older brother was quite skinny. He was really skinny and frail. I was pretty frail at that point, although I became a tomboy very soon thereafter. And my other brother was robust, but he was only six. I was eight, nine, and ten for three years in the uh, plain school down here where we started up the hill. And in that, those days, there were no adults accompanying us. The three of us, and I think Roy Swan may have been a part of it also, uh, we hiked up the hill here, which at that age we were little and it was huge. It was a big hill. And I remember that it was much harder to go up than to return to the school, which we did after our lunches. And how cool is that? And, you know, so I learned about being in the woods other than in Highland, where I was out in the woods all the time. Uh, this was my first experience climbing this hill, going by this rostrum, which was really kind of buried in foliage and vines and whatnot. But it was a wonderful experience. And there were no adults telling us what to do. And so we would trot up or walk up or, you know, we got eaten by the bugs or you name it. But we had a great experience early in our lives, which I am so thankful for. And from there, what I would like to say is that Peter Burley was a wonderful human being. He was saving the world. You know, he sued Monsanto, Governor Rockefeller, GE, and he won. I wish he were still here. I wish that Al Gore was being more like Peter. I wish there were some leaders out there who would not be afraid. And he wasn't ever afraid. And oh my God, I mean, you know, it was a little tough on us. But, but, but he was really something. By far the one of our, my, our children who is the most like Peter is Mary. So watch out. <laughs> She has very strong values, very strong leadership. She has accomplished a lot already in her life. And just wait. I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of Mary. And uh, those of you who have encountered her even a little bit know how her value system is very, very strong. She doesn't suffer fools. And, God bless her, is all I can say. The other thing I would like to say just quickly, because I'm really thankful, is Libby Wade is the interim down in St. Paul. Oh, Libby Wade is the interim minister. Laurel Hill has always had music, a local man of the cloth, or a woman, and I'm so glad it's a woman. And it's a wonderful tradition, which brings together a community in a way that not too many other things do. Uh, you know, we are all so silly about who we are or what we are or what we think we are or, you know, whatever. This is a very nice tradition that encompasses a whole lot of things. Now, the other thing I would just like to say one more thing, and Hillary, stop me when you want to, but I, I, am, um, I grew up in a room at Highland House which is a beautiful place. Through my mother's families, my view growing up was of the entire uh, Tiringham Valley. And I could see the Ashantelli, I think I saw the fire, but I don't really remember that. But the Ashantelli columns were from my bedroom view. And if you don't think that has an impact on somebody growing up, um, so anyway, one of my things in life, I've done a lot of things, um, and I'm still doing them. I'm, I'm feeling great. My latest thing is I love the beavers. And I really think the beavers we need to really protect. Um, and and I, there's a, the most wonderful book, which I recommend to everybody, Beaver Lane. And Lila Phillips is the author. This is a woman who dedicated herself to really learning about the beavers and the history way back to Henry VIII. And I mean, how cool is that? I mean, what a great thing for, to do in your life. 
It's a wonderful book. And I just love it. I've given away five copies already. I'm going to order a bunch for my huge number of people, family and people. The one thing that I still have very high on my agenda, I have quite a few things that I would suggest that Floral Hill might do, but I'm not going to do that here. Um, the view sheds in the Berkshires are disappearing. I have been a hot horse on my horse or whatever to protect view sheds. Do you realize that Monument Mountain and I have really worked hard to gather people? People can tell you that it's I've you know, told them you've got to protect this piece of land which is coming on the market. Um, Monument Mountain sits in the center of the Berkshires. It has been threatened over the years by various things. It was a very important part of the, the indigenous history, and people know about that which is good, and we should know more, and they may enter the scene again. But it is the local small group, the land trust. We have to keep track of that stuff. And the view shed from our property on the north side of Monument Mountain, and I say this with great feeling because there was a little bit of internal family stuff over this, but I did persevere, and the uh, I was on the Chesterwood board. Paul Ivory was a saint and helped in so many ways with so many things. And the view shed for Daniel Chester French was important to what he made and did in his sculptures across this, especially the East Coast. The view shed is the view of Chesterwood, Tanglewood, Prospect Hill, Rattlesnake Mountain. Uh, if you keep going along, it's the view shed from the Marian Fathers. It's the view shed from it, it's the view shed from uh, everywhere in Stockbridge, especially. Um, you know, I would say Ice Glen Road is blessed. So the view sheds are bigger than any one of us. It takes a collective. And it takes bravery, and sometimes your neighbors won't be happy. But I'm here to say it's worth the fight. And one of the things that really stuck in my mind when I went to China with a friend just briefly on a tour, and the thing that I noticed is that the Chinese were planting trees along every single road that they had. And they were planting big trees, and they had thousands of people planting trees. And I'm here to say we're behind the eight ball. We do more to cut down trees than not. I have a, one of my favorite trees here is butternut, a butternut tree. They are very rare, becoming more so. There were a bunch of them at Sky Farm. There is one of the most beautiful in anywhere, just off Route 7. It's a magnificent tree. There are a couple at the sheep farm in hedgerows, but what I do is I collect nuts in the fall, if there are any, and I toss them in hedgerows. And and I have two nice ones in, at the sheep farm, but that's a tree that we shouldn't lose. Now, the other one that grows extremely well here are walnuts. My grandfather brought from Minnesota in his pockets. He was an a, a engineer on a train. He brought in his pockets, walnuts. And they plant, he planted them with my mother, who loved to have, she loved planting trees. And Mary can tell you that growing up, that that was one of the things we did in our family, you planted trees. And the walnuts have taken off, they're everywhere. And they are really hardy, they are absolutely beautiful. And when I was going down the Salmon River with Peter on a raft and Mary, and a few people, we came around a corner and there was this grove of walnut trees. It was a really amazing thing. And, and those trees, I will never forget them. And from then on, I planted walnut trees everywhere I can, like the butternuts. But the butternuts don't seem to come up. I'm not sure why. But the, the walnut trees do. So if you know anybody with a walnut tree, get some of their seeds. And it's a really cool thing to do.
Only song that we is just for us, Old Laurel Hill, and I want to my reign to end someday with everyone knowing this song. So let's take it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> feel free to stand or sit. You've been sitting a lot and you may want to just stand, but my <laughs> remarks are going to be brief. I'm so happy to be able to be here today to have been invited to know more about the Laurel Hill Association and all the wonderful work that it, this association has done over 170 yes. years. Yes. yes. Yeah. To get that in one more time. My introduction to this particular spot has been very recent. I only discovered it with my husband sometime last year, maybe at the beginning of spring of 2022, when we were setting out to walk on um, the Mary Flynn Trail, which we've done often in the nine years we've lived here, and discovered, I think you all had just refurbished it probably, a sign that pointed in this direction, and we decided to take a chance on that hike and wandered into this space and just were so amazed. I remember thinking how magical and mystical the space felt and I just wanted to stay there for a while. We have a, a grandson who is our pride and joy and a, not too long after that he and his dad were visiting us for the weekend from Boston. And we decided to bring them and share the wonder of this place with them. Jimmy, the grandson, was two years old at the time. He already loved the Stockbridge Playground and liked hiking with his dad. But he, so he made his way up the trail behind his dad and me. And then coming into this opening, we were coming from this side, and coming into this opening, he suddenly just stopped in his tracks and started moving and turning in circles with his arms stretched out, marveling at this open meadow of the amphitheater 
enclosed by trees and with the light from above. I think I heard him say, whoa, look at that. Then after he carefully took some time to explore the stone dais and put a few things in his pocket to take home to show his mom, we moved on to climb the hill on the other side. My son was leading with Jimmy just behind. I followed with my husband bringing up the rear. We were all enjoying the brightness of that spring day, the fresh air and the light filtering through the trees. As we came to the top of a small rise, I saw Jimmy stop and bend down, and I wondered if something was actually wrong at this point. But it wasn't that at all. My little nature explorer had bent down to pick up one of those pretty little wildflowers that we adults sometimes just walk by without even seeing. He turned towards me, bent down on one knee, held that small flower dripping over his hand, and with a serious face said, a boy picks a flower and gives it to a friend. Here, Grandmom. Well, as you might expect, my heart melted, and I'm sure he probably got that line and maybe that motion from something he'd seen on TV or a book somebody had read to him. But as I hugged him close and we walked the rest of the way to the Mary Flynn Trail, I was thankful for this mystical piece of nature once again and the gifts of nature that can feed the soul of an adult and inspire a toddler to joyful sharing of God's creation. We give thanks today for places like this and the work that has gone into preserving such spaces of natural history. Thanks to the Holy One who created the wonders of nature and thanks to the people who long ago recognized the need to keep them free for all to enjoy and thanks to those who continue in their footsteps toward the future. Conservationist and educator Terry Tempest Williams once wrote, the eyes of the future are looking back at us to see beyond our own time. They are kneeling with hands clasped that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to be. The Laurel Hill Society has been a protector of the land. You've made sure to leave room in Stockbridge for future eyes to know this beauty, for a small boy to kneel on the earth and present a wildflower to his grandmother, for people to walk these trails and find solace among the silence of the trees, for wildlife to thrive, and so that generations to come can interact with and know the power of nature. As we conclude today's program, may we dedicate ourselves to continue caring for the earth. I offer the following as both a benediction or blessing and as a challenge. We join with the earth and with each other to bring new life to the land, to restore the waters, to refresh the air. We join with the earth and with each other to renew the forests to care for the plants, to protect the creatures. We join with the earth and each other to celebrate the rivers and seas, to rejoice in the sunlight, to sing the song of the stars. We join with the earth and we, with each other to recreate the human community, to promote justice and peace, to remember our children. We join with the earth and with each other. We join together as many and diverse expressions of one loving mystery for the healing of the earth and the renewal of all life. Amen. Amen. Please join in singing Joyful, Joyful. <clears throat> Yeah.
Thank you all so much for coming. I just have a couple of thanks that didn't make the program, but I'm sure you are grateful for the insect repellent wipes <laughs> that the Arcadian shop gave 80 of them to us. And you will soon be joyful for the big box of yummy chocolates that Josh Needleman at Chocolate Springs donated. Videotaping, thank you so much for CTSB, the community television of South Berkshire. And thank you, Stockbridge Police, for the police presence. Almost invisible, but it was free, so we thank them. And finally, Sedgwick Path and Rostrum Glen Cleanup, Tim O'Brien, thank you so much. Thank you all.